morning. Let's stand for the scripture reading today. From Psalm 8, 1, 4 through 5, and 9. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. When I look at the sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with the glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name (coughs) fills the earth. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We just ask that you would show us your presence in a mighty way today, Lord. Help us just to feel that you're here with us. We know that you are, but help us to feel that your presence, Lord, and to just worship you with everything that we have. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we do come to you at this, this sweet hour of prayer. And Lord, we just lift our voices to you and praise your holy name. And we know, Lord, that you alone are worthy of our praise and adoration, and that's why we're here. To lift up your name, to lift up the name of Jesus above every name. And so, God, I just pray that as we honor you and worship you here today, that you would reveal yourself to us through your word. We know you're present here with us. It's just a matter of us setting aside everything from our busy schedules, from our thoughts and our, our plans for the rest of the day and the week, that we might hear your word, your word of, of comfort, your word of encouragement, your word of of challenge. For we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. All right. Turn that down a little bit. Is that a little better? Yes, I think so. Well, welcome everyone. We're glad you're here on this, the Lord's Day. Still a little is it a little loud? No? Yes? Echoey. Echoey, she says. It just could be. All right, we'll see if that's a little better. Testing, yes? A little better, maybe? All right, well, again, welcome everyone into the Lord's house. We're glad you're here. You know, the Lord has a blessing for you for having been here and having uh, been watching uh, on our um, Facebook Live feed as well. This is the first Sunday of the month, which means the time to recognize our birthdays. Okay, is there anyone here today that has a birthday in October? You do. Don, come up here. We don't have to have a piano to sing happy birthday. I don't think. We'll see how it goes. All right, are y'all ready? Everybody has to sing really loud because no piano. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Woohoo! Yay! All right. Happy birthday to you. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful birthday. All right. Y'all clap, clap, clap. All right, are there any October anniversaries? Any October anniversaries today? None that we know of that are here anyway. Okay, well, to anyone out there that's listening and you have an October anniversary, happy anniversary to you. All right, thank you. This is a fair week, is it not, for Rockwall Independent School District, which means there will not be any Wednesday night activities. Yes, right? Is that correct? No Wednesday night activities this Wednesday night for the kids or for the teens because it is a Rockwall ISD fair day. And that's the, we follow the school uh, schedule. If they are off on a Wednesday, then we are off on that Wednesday. Okay, and uh, we do have an offering plate at the back for those that would like to uh, give their tithes and offerings this morning. You can always use the Givelify app or you can send a check to the church either through your personal check or your bank uh, using the online bill pay service can send a check to us. All kinds of ways of getting your tithes and your offerings. Here we have a Diamond A missions offering as well and that money goes to Solomon and Anita uh, and their ministry in uh, Amori Fay Ministries in Honduras. Go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn to the Gospel of Mark. That's where we are. That's where we have been. That's where we will be for a long time. Yes, children are dismissed for junior church at this time. Gospel of Mark. Question before we get started. Could it be that we are just like the people in the days of Jesus? Could it be that we are so familiar with Jesus that we dismiss his authority as many of them tended to do? 
Could it be that we are so familiar with Jesus that we perpetuate the dominance of the evil one and his forces in our lives? Hmm. Let me tell you about a woman named Norma. Norma lived in a middle, uh, in the middle of nowhere, Texas, somewhere out in West Texas, middle of nowhere. She was born in a, in a small little cabin to parents that were um, kind of like pioneer parents, really, in the, in the area. Uh, she had less than a high school education. She spent her entire life in this local little area, and she hated to travel. But at least once a year, a team from Gourmet Magazine and Bon Appetit Magazine would arrive at her home to cook a fantastic feast with her and to talk about her cooking. Norma was an unbelievably phenomenal cook. Her beef roast was tender, succulent, delicious. Oh, it was really good. Her soups, her stews were irresistible. Her, her desserts were something to, to be desired. She could make the most ordinary, everyday item into something extraordinary. She had this innate ability, as it seemed, to understand how to take the simple, everyday flavors and to make them just pop. One day, the new pastor in town came to visit. They sat down in the living room to talk, and there was a place in front of the pastor, a plate, rather, in front of the pastor that was filled and piled high with chocolate chip cookies. And they were chatting along, and at some point during the conversation, the pastor took one of the cookies, and wow, the cookie was just breathtaking. And he, couldn't, he was stunned, and he couldn't even remember what they had been talking about. He had never tasted a chocolate chip cookie quite like this before, or ever since, for that matter. Norma just laughed, as she always did, and says, I always get that same reaction with these cookies. What the pastor found out and was so curious is this. She was very well known in town. Many in town had tasted her fabulous food, but no one in town seemed to care. Why is it that the experts in gourmet cooking could travel thousands of miles to have an opportunity to cook with her, but her neighbors down the street just saw her as, oh, it's Norma. That's normal. That's what Norma does. Was it that they were clueless? That they were jealous? That they were too familiar with her and her cooking? Well, maybe a, each, a little of each. But no matter what any of her neighbors thought of her, she was by far the best cook in town and maybe even in the best in the state. When we look at the scripture that we're going to look at this morning, we see that Jesus is rejected by his hometown. They grew up with him and they heard uh, and, and as we read this passage, we're going to find it. It's obvious to us that them being familiar with him was a roadblock to their faith in him. Because they thought they knew all about him, they had difficulty believing in him. What we're going to learn from this passage is that we can become so familiar with Jesus that it causes us unbelief. I mean, because... And, and that's really just the first level of understanding in this passage, and we'll get into that. But unfortunately, the thing that happened to the people in Jesus' hometown happens to us as well. So let's look at this. Mark 7, Mark 7, verse 1. Mark 7, excuse me, 6, right? Verse, uh, Mark 6, verse 1. Mark 6, verse 1, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They asked, where did he get all his wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? He's just the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. 
Verse 4, Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any mighty miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Now, that's a sermon all in itself. And I came across a, a devotional this week that says, did you, ever, did you know that there was a time when God was amazed? I mean, think about it. Is God ever amazed at anything? And he was amazed at their unbelief. A whole different sermon. We'll get to that some other day. Then... Um, And we'll have, hang on to that other passage for a little later. So, again, the question, could it be that we are just like the people in the days of Jesus? Could it be that we're so familiar with him that we dismiss his authority and we continue to perpetuate the dominance of evil in our lives? The short answer is yes. Absolutely. Without doubt, we can be just like them. What's the old saying? Familiarity breeds Contempt. As we look at the first part of this scripture or this passage that we just read, it's hard for us to understand the full impact of what's being said here. As we read it in English, it gives the impression that they're amazed at his words, but since he's a friend and a neighbor, the guy down the street, it's hard for them to get past this fact because he's just an ordinary guy to them. But when we read this uh, in the Greek, which we're not going to do, but if we were to read it in the Greek and put with it the Hebrew culture, we'd find something a little bit different going on here. The people of his hometown were outright hostile and mean to Jesus. So when we look at this, this passage, we see contempt from these local folks towards Jesus. Verse 2, we see that it says they are amazed at his teaching. This in itself is nothing out of the ordinary. We read in other passages of Scripture. In fact, in John 7, uh, we're told that the temple guards were impressed by Jesus' teaching. They said, no one ever spoke the way this man does. That's what the guards in the temple said. And they had heard a lot of different uh, men uh, do some extraordinary teaching in their day. But yet, they were amazed. But here, the amazement... Spoken is not of wonder in the sense that the guards were talking about, but it's, a, in, it's in the sense of, no, this is, they're in shocked disbelief. And they're thinking, can these words be coming out of this guy's mouth? This is no possible way, they're saying. There's no possible way that Jesus could come up with this on his own. He had to have gotten it someplace. I guess they were <laughs> accusing him of plagiarism or something. I don't know. <laughs> They're saying, where does he get this? What's, the, what, what's this wisdom that has been given to him? How does he even do these miracles? And they feel that his wisdom has been given to him, as you see in, in verse 3. Again, in the Greek language and with the Hebrew culture behind it, there are two slurs that are given to Jesus here. First one is, isn't this the carpenter? And to us, it kind of just sounds like, well, they're just questioning, hey, isn't this Jesus, the, the guy that grew up? But they're really saying this in a derogatory way. This is just a carpenter. He's a common laborer. He's uneducated, low-level worker. Where in the world does he get this, this pretense? Where does he get this, the gall to, to teach us the meaning of scriptures? Who does he think he is? That's what they're saying here. And the people are filled with contempt to him and, and they're attempting uh, and they see Jesus as attempting to do more than uh, to know more than they know. The second insult is, isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? By the way, you see that Jesus had quite a large family. He, Mary and Joseph had other uh, children. So it was a house full of kids, and Jesus is one of them. Isn't this the guy that just was, grew up with them? Don't we know them? Now you have to understand that you have to understand that it was wrong in their culture 
to describe a man as the son of his mother. They should have said, if they were being respectful for them, isn't this the son of Joseph? But no, they're pointing out, isn't this the son of Mary? You know, the one who had him before she was married to Joseph? That's the derogatory little hint that's going on here. This is the same Jesus? You see, this conversation that they're having isn't a conversation about a local boy making good. It's a conversation about the audacity of a local boy to come to them and try to teach them and to uh, share with them that he is the Son of God. Since Jesus was a working class guy without a formal education, he had had to get this wisdom somewhere, so where did he get it? Maybe it goes back to what has been said earlier. Maybe they thought that uh, it came from Beelzebub as well, right? But we don't know. Um, I came across a story... uh, just thinking in terms of him being a, a common worker and uh, just people just saying, well, he's just a common guy. He's, he's nothing spectacular, right? Well, Supreme Court Judge Clarence Thomas tells a story about when he was judge of the Court of Appeals in Washington. He drove his car one morning out of the courthouse parking lot, and, and as he was waiting for an opening in the traffic, a man opened the back door of his car and climbed in, And he gave the judge an address and asked him to hurry. You see, this guy saw a black driver and a nice car and assumed that it was a car for hire. He assumed from his worldview that this, he had to have been just a working class Joe. In But in reality, Clarence Thomas was one of the most powerful and is one of the most powerful men in the country. The Supreme Court justices, we would not know them on the street, but they are very, very important to our judicial system. In the same way, here in this passage, the people of Nazareth saw Jesus as just a working class guy, but in reality, he is the God of the universe. Now, though the people of his town saw evidence right before them that his teachings and that he, had, that he was doing these mighty works, they were, they, they were not able to cross the line. Now, what line is it that I'm speaking of? Because it's an important line, and it's the same line that is standing in front of us. Are we able to cross the line? We know about Jesus. We know of his greatness. We know without a doubt we sing about him and we sing songs of praise to him. We know that he's special. We read the stories. But all of us here have to cross the line, and it's a difficult line. And here's the line. Is the authority of Jesus the authority that we are living under? You see, that's the question of his hometown. They were not willing to accept his authority. And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we willing to accept his authority in our life? The question here in this entire passage is one of authority. It's as if they had question authority bumper stickers on their ox carts. You don't ever see any of those kind of bumper stickers around here, do you? They're not puzzled. They're not scratching their head. They're irritated. They're annoyed that Jesus is one of authority among them. And they are not going to or wanting to trust his authority. Remember, we've seen in the book of Mark that Jesus is the authority, period. When it comes to matters of life and death, 
He has the authority over nature. He has authority over sickness and disease. He has authority over the demonic forces in the world. He has authority over death. We just saw that. But yet, those in his hometown were so familiar with him that they were not ready to cross over and to give them, him the authority in their lives. Folks, it doesn't matter what the authorities of our world say. It doesn't matter what Oprah says or even Dr. Phil. The authority in our lives is to be Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to place yourself under his authority. And Jesus demands that you respect that authority. Here in his hometown, they didn't respect it. They didn't even consider his teachings. They had no faith. But that's not the end of it. You see, because they did not, have, did not respect the authority of Jesus, the power of God is not effective in their lives. Right? Now, we have to be careful here and not gloss over the issue because if we're careful, we'll come to the wrong conclusion. We could come to the conclusion that my lack of faith will cause the power of God to cease in my life. But that's not what Mark is saying here. The issue is that of authority. Right? Notice that, that it doesn't say that Jesus was unable, that the power of God was made void. No. Jesus still had power. Did he not? I mean, he is God. And here's the fact. God is the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing, awesome, beyond anything. We cannot hinder the power of God. That's not what it's saying here. But we can somehow, through doubts, through denial, stop the power of God from working in our lives. God never changes. Jesus is God. His power cannot be removed or diminished. But the people's lack of faith is what reduced the power. And our lack of faith can prevent us from having the blessings of God in our life. It's not just a matter of somatics. This is how God operates consistently throughout Scripture. God is always, always, always able. But we can choose to refuse. Here we see that their refusal to believe results in missing out on the phenomenal guidance and the healing that he could have. He, it says that he couldn't do anything there. Make sure that you're under the authority of Jesus so Jesus can do something for you. You see, it's not a, oh, if you'll do this for me, then I'll give you the authority. No, it's the other way. You give the authority of your life to Jesus, then you are able to have him work and move and the power and your life. That's what this is all about. Jesus Christ is the authority, period. Receive this understanding into your life and then watch God work. You see, there's areas in your life and areas in my life where we know that Jesus is teaching us to live this way or to live that way to make this decision or to make that decision based on him being our authority. How are we doing? You see, our, our entire, and it's not just our society. This has been a problem since the beginning of time. We see this in Jesus' day. We see it through history. People have bucked authority in their lives. Why? Because they want to be I want to be in charge because it's all about me, right? But if it's all about me, then it can't be all about you, and then that's when we begin to have problems. 
Because it can't be all about all of us. That's why it has to be all about God. And we have to all have to submit to his authority. Do you realize that's why the family unit was created by God and, and the creational glue of the family was put together where a man and a woman came together and they're the ones that have children into the world and they began to teach their children authority and to respect them as parents, which is the child's first understanding of the authority of God. And we have to be so careful as Christians not to buck the authority above us. Wherever that authority is. Have you all ever noticed that it's those that have authority issues that try to exude their authority over others? <laughs> Interesting. Well... Bottom line, the work of God could not be done in these people's lives because they had not submitted to the authority of Jesus. That's not true in your life, is it? I hope not. I hope not. I pray that you will give your life to Jesus and that he will be your authority. Now, these next few verses, 7 through 12, we're not going to look at these as, a, as such for an entire sermon, but just very quickly look at these, and, and you'll see at these verses, 7 through 12, it's Jesus sending out his disciples into uh, to the villages around uh, doing missionary work, telling about Jesus. And, and bottom line, it comes down and it says that they went out, tell, verse 12, and they went out uh, telling all that they met to turn from their sins. In other words, to repent. To repent from their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and they healed many. Now, the instructions that were given, though, were if you go into an area and they are not listening, just shake the dust off your feet and move on. What's he saying? He's saying that I am giving you my authority at this point to go out and to spread the good news of the coming of the kingdom. And if people are willing to accept my authority, then God will move in their lives. If they don't, then there's nothing you can do for them. Move on. Again, it's a question of authority. This next little section is about authority and yielding our lives to Jesus. What area of your life do you need to place under the authority of Jesus? Maybe it's the question of what area of your life do you need to keep under the authority of Jesus? Because if you're like me, you'll put it there and then you'll want to come out from the authority of Jesus and do your own thing, and oh, and I better get back. Oh, and I'm, let's stay under the authority of Jesus and not be like his hometown. Let's receive him. Let's accept him. Let's know how good and great God is. God is God alone. He created us. He has the right above any other being to demand us to respect his authority because he gave us life in the first place. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, as we just think of you and the authority that we are to give you and to honor you with, I just pray that we would submit, that we would yield, that we would surrender, because it's only when we, we respect your authority and place our lives under your authority that your blessings and power and joy and peace will come in and fill us and grant us life and life to the full. Lord, we just pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. I just pray, Lord, that as we read Scripture and we see places where people in the Bible, in Jesus' hometown, I don't 
honor him and grant him the authority that is due to him, that it would be a lesson to us. It would be a wake-up call to us that we must, in order to receive the blessings and the power of God working in our life, we must place our lives under your authority. For you are God alone from the beginning of time and will be forevermore. I pray this, Lord, your blessing upon us as we leave. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you.